Sadia Musafar is a tech entrepreneur and author and passionate advocate of responsible innovation, decent work for everyone, and prosperity of immigrant talent in STEM. In 2017, she was featured in Canada 150 Women, a book about 150 of the, of the most influential and brown, brown, groundbreaking women in Canada. She's founder of Tech Girls Canada, the hub for Canadian women in science and technology, engineering and math, and co-founder of Tech Reset Canada, a coalition of business people, technologists, and other residents advocating for innovation that is focused on maximizing the public good. She's part of Canada Beyond 150, Policy for a Diverse and Inclusive Futures Feminist Government Initiative, and an advisor to Government of Canada's Economic Strategy Tables for the Access to Skilled Talent, Talent Working Group. Her work on modern leadership explores big, idea, big ideas and impactful strategies that address growing challenges for business leaders in today's connected and vigilant markets. And has been featured in CN, CNN Money, Fortune Magazine, Globe and Mail, Vice, CBC, TVO, and Chatelaine. Sadia is also a Pushcart Prize nominated short fiction writer. In February 2018, her work joins that of Margaret Atwood, Ga Gabby Rivera, Hope Larson, and Amy Chu in Dark Horses Comics' new anthology featuring comic and prose stories. Recently, Sadia and her team released Change Together, a diversity guide book for startups and scale ups. Please join me in welcoming Sadia. I remember that day vividly, the way you remember things before you've learned what they're named or what they're called. I am nine years old. It's the middle of July. It's summer vacation. It's really hot. I'm standing by the door in our kitchen. I feel someone approach me from behind, and I felt something hard and very cold on my back. I've often wondered how I knew what gunmetal feels like against your skin. But somehow I did. They led me through uh, the house and towards my parents' bedroom at gunpoint. Um, this part is blurry in my mind. I remember approaching my mother who went ashen in her face as she realized what was happening. For the next hour, these strangers turned our home upside down. They packed valuables in our pillowcases. They ate the fruit we had and chucked the pits and skins on the clean floors. And we sat around, my mother huddled and watching. After they had ransacked the entire place, they left, and none of us moved for what felt like an eternity. My mother suddenly got up to go call my dad at work. I found my nine-year-old self running as fast as I could upstairs to my room. I got there. I reached into my closet and pulled out a really heavy and big pile of library books that I had borrowed. I counted them as fast as I could and then sunk into the floor with relief that they had not taken any of my books. I share this story with you to tell you that today, this morning, you're talking to somebody who thinks that books are sacred and their future matters. And I felt this for a really, really long time. So thank you for joining me. There's a lot that we can talk about that will impact the future of books and that of book publishing, um, specifically when it comes to trends and technology, uh, that will have a significant impact. We can look to the energy sector and draw some lessons from them um, as we face a massive overhaul in that sector as renewable energy uh, changes the game by becoming cheaper and cheaper and more accessible. What happens to energy generation companies, much like book publishing companies, um, when the marginal cost of producing their main product gets very close to zero? What do they change in their business model uh, to when individuals and farms and even some manufacturing places don't need them? for their energy needs. We can talk about blockchain. Uh, we can look to how blockchain will eliminate several, if not all, layers of middle people. And what do businesses that rely on distribution and supply chains do when that layer is eliminated? Or we can talk about retail. 
we can see how lowered barriers to access when it comes to online catalogs, real-time production, same-day shipping, changes the game. What, where do retailers add value in the buyer journey when they're not responsible for the one thing they've been responsible for forever, which is access to their products? We could talk about all of that. And you will get to hear about some of those things from today's stellar speaker lineup. I want to talk to you about a different set of things that will also impact the business that you're in. And I'm wondering if enough people are thinking about those things. So to help us dive into that, I'm gonna refer to Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. Some of you might have seen that talk. Um, he refers to uh, individuals who lead and businesses and organizations who are trying to figure out how to do what they do best through this paradigm. And it's really simple. So we have three circles in front of us. He talks about the what. He says 100% of people know what they do. So for many of you in this room, you would say we publish books. That's very clear to everybody. A smaller percentage know how they do it. So the how is more about differentiating. What, why you? Why do people buy from you? So you could say something like, we are the category leaders for self-help books, as an example. That's your differentiator. But very, very few people, he says, know why they do what they do. And when we say why, we don't mean to make profit. Profit is a result. Um, and there, it's always a result. By why, he says, he means, what is your purpose? What is your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get up in the morning? Why should anybody care? That's the why. And that, you can imagine, is a tough one. So I don't know what your story is. I don't know if the story that you started working in the sector with is still your story? Is it the story that rides with you on your commute to work every day? Sometimes we change. What I do know is that we, the people, need you and your talent and your work to help us in very specific ways in the coming years. So I'm hoping that our conversation today will help you answer some of our SOS calls. A few hundred years of following the cult of efficiency has left us in a place of sound bites and fake news. It's a place devoid of reflection and one that incentivizes polarization and extremism. We need help in grappling with what brought us here and we need to hear that from many, many different people. People with lived experiences, people who have studied these and are experts, and people who have inherited this knowledge from their ancestors. We need to hear from them all. And we need you to help legitimize nuance and complexity. Again, becoming informed needs to become a worthwhile pursuit. This requires us to be okay with slowing down, with asking a lot more questions than we're comfortable with. And we need to do that collectively and give each other permission to be okay doing that in our work. And while we're at it, someone needs to talk to those 100 books, like reading 100 books in a year, people, uh, because I don't know if that really works, and if you can remember, that's a lot of books, even though that'd be good for book publishing. Uh, I wanna share a story with you. So, on that map you see Silverton, Oregon, a small town of about 10,000 people, Republican, always very staunchly conservative. Um, it is the home to Stu Rasmussen, who is an avid metal worker, woodworker, an electrician in that town. He inherited from his father, who inherited from his father, this movie theater. That's the only movie theater in that town, and they've operated forever. So you can imagine with all those skills, Everybody knows too. Like this is the kind of town where even if you dial the wrong number, you know who answered. And he describes what he went through as the slowest transition in history. So many, many years ago, 
Stu started to paint his nails, very masculine colors like black. Um, he very slowly, and I mean over years, started to paint his nails more feminine colors. And remember, he's like the operator of the movie theater, so he would hand out tickets and people would be surprised every time his hand would come out of the teller uh, booth because his nails were painted. This town was really uncomfortable with that, but they went along. After a couple of years, Stu added high heels to his plaid shirt outfit. That was like his regular thing. Again, very uncomfortable for people. But he did it so slowly, and he remembers it like a social experiment. He's like, what if I did this? Let's see what people will say. And over time, as he made those changes, Radio Lab, which is a podcast, was interviewing people in this town and asking them, what do you think? What do you think of this? And they're like, we're really uncomfortable. We don't know what's going on here. But they always ended the response with, it's complicated. It's complicated because this is somebody they knew. And because this was somebody they knew, they couldn't shun him. This was the Stu who had fix their circuit breaker. This was the same person they saw every weekend for the movies. This is somebody they had taught in their high school. So it was harder to label him one thing when they knew the person. I share this with you because we need you to help us to get to know one another so that it would be complicated to label the other other. So it would be uncomfortable steps towards a new normal, because we all know that we need new normals. And we need you and your work to show us that. We need less fear. We need more kindness. We need more curiosity. And we need more patience. We need you to understand this thing that somebody shared with me the other day. They said, we think that the human species is this warmongering, greedy, violent species. Because when we read our history, that's all we see. But the fact of the matter is that historians have always chosen to document turmoil. I think we need to change that. I think our stories need to change. Because nobody has documented harmony. And we feel as though that's all we are. And this essentialism is harmful and dangerous and false. So we need you to please remind us of our resilience, that we have done better before and we should do better again. With the pace of change becoming more and more exponential, most days most people feel that we are hurtling towards this inevitable future. Um, it's mostly dystopian. We have a ravaged planet. Uh, we have profound income inequality. We have artificial intelligence overlords. And if um, Elon Musk has his way, we have tourism on Mars. Uh, but we need you to remind us that we have the right to multiple futures. That this inevitable sounding progression uh, can not only be slowed and sorted, and reimagined, we can halt some of these things. We can actually stop them. So we need you to show us the futures that many people are dreaming of right now that tell us that we can go in many different directions and imagine a bigger, fuller life for all of us. Emile Durkheim introduced a sociological concept called collective effervescence to describe how a community or society can at times come together and simultaneously communicate the same thought and participate in the same action. It was coined to indicate how communal gatherings intensify, electrify, and enlarge religious experiences. Bringing people together in close proximity, he said, generates a kind of electricity that quickly transports them to an extraordinary degree of exaltation. So what does this have to do with the why of book publishing? 
I am suggesting that you and I rig this spaceship's destiny, that we actually change the course of where we're going by being really intentional and injecting powerful and transformative ideas because you are in this business. You are in the business of generating, propagating, legitimizing ideas. And that's a huge responsibility, but also a lot of power. We need ideas that are nuanced and complicated because they're attempting fairness. Ideas that help us get to know one another so that we're less afraid and more kind and more courageous. Ideas that encourage us to not settle for any inevitable future and dream. We can create this collective effervescence, you and I. Because in that future, guns never trump books. Thank you. <laughs>